more stools coming. Oh, well, you want to start waiting? You know, throw it out. All right, good evening, everyone. Can you guys all hear me okay? okay. Yeah, pretty Please much. Please gather in if you need to uh, hear me better. Uh, hi to everybody at home on Facebook Live. Um, once again, my name is Thiru, Thiru Vignaraja. Thank you guys for coming out to this town hall. Uh, first of all, can we all give taps a round of applause for hosting this? Yeah. Yeah. This is the easiest town hall for us to host because they provide the drinks, they provide the ambiance, and you guys provide the cheer. Um, what I want to do is actually talk for a very few minutes and then open it up for questions. This is meant to be a true town hall, a chance for you guys to hear a little bit from me, but then to share your perspectives and ask your questions. Um, for those of you who don't know my story, the fate of my family has been tied to the future of this city from before I was born. Uh, it was 1970 when my mom was here, hi mom, um, came from Sri Lanka to teach math at Pali High School. Uh, she went back over to Sri Lanka, begrudgingly my, married my father, uh, uh, had me and my sister, and left under very different circumstances. The second time they were coming over, they were fleeing a civil war. Uh, and with the clothes on their back and with two infants in their arms, they were searching for a better life, and Baltimore gave them the chance. Uh, my mother, who had started at Poly, got her PhD at 62 and finished her career at Morgan State. Uh, my father, thank you, Mom. My sister and I sometimes say that she was born a hundred years too early. Uh, my father, uh, also a lifelong educator and teacher, started at Edmondson and then was at Douglas and then was at Southern and then was at Western. Uh, when he retired, he was the oldest teacher teaching in the state of Maryland. He was 80 years old. Uh, he's 83 now. Uh, he does not look 83. He does not act 83. I don't think he likes me telling people he's 83. Um, but that's the tradition which I was raised. A uh, tradition of public service, a tradition of gratitude, a tradition of hard work. Um, we realized every day how hard they worked and how hard we were expected to work to earn the privilege, the blessings that we had been given. And so we did. I was the product of public schools myself. I went from Edmondson Heights Elementary to Woodlawn High School, and then I went on to Yale for college and Harvard for law school. Um, as I sometimes say, I was president of the Harvard Law Review before Barack Obama made it cool. Um, and then I returned here and devoted myself to public service. I was a federal and city prosecutor. I was the chief of major investigations in Baltimore City, and then I was deputy attorney general for the state of Maryland. Um, I love being a prosecutor. I love being a public servant. Um, I love Baltimore, and during that phase, we were not only creating a safer city, we were also creating a more just one. We were arresting fewer and fewer people. We had fewer and fewer young black men incarcerated for petty offenses, and we had murders and shootings and carjackings at historic lows. It was not that long ago that we had murders below 200. It was 197 murders in 2011 when I was head of major investigations. And we were not using mass incarceration or mandatory minimums or zero tolerance. We were working in concert with our partners. We were working collaboratively in the most devastated neighborhoods to bring violent repeat offenders and gangs to justice. I believe very much that we can do it again. I have pledged to bring murders to below 200 in three years. And if I don't, I won't run for re-election. And we will do it the right way, without mandatory minimums, without zero tolerance policies. I have pledged to guarantee universal pre-k pre for every three and four year old in Baltimore City. Free college for every graduate of a Baltimore City public high school without raising taxes, in fact, while lowering them to the county level over the course of 10 years. And I have pledged to grow our economy and grow our city without gentrification, in an inclusive way. Next year, Baltimore will become the only city in America that is smaller in 2020 than it was in 1920. Just take that in for a minute. 
a city of almost a million people that will this year fall below 600,000. That doesn't have to be the future of our city just because it is our prologue. We know that we can rebuild from ashes the kind of city that we can all be proud of. We know that we can create the kind of inclusive, diverse society that is open to all that we can all be proud of. Um, my father taught at Douglas High School, as I mentioned, and the most proud graduate of Douglas High School is none other than Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall became the greatest Supreme Court Justice in American history. Um, someone had asked if I could share a story from Baltimore's history uh, that reveals the best of Baltimore. I cannot think of a story better than this. Um, Thurgood Marshall went from Douglas High School to Lincoln University. And after Lincoln University, he wanted desperately to go to the University of Maryland Law School, the flagship law school in his home city. Yeah. Go carry he law school. Denied him he was black. They wouldn't let him in because he was black. So he went to Howard Law School, where he met Charles Hamilton Houston, the dean of Howard Law School. Dean Houston was the first African American admitted to the Harvard Law Review. Um, and so if you're ever at the Law Review in Cambridge, they have pictures of every class all the way back to 1887, but they only have one portrait. One portrait. It's not of Barack Obama. It's not of any of the Supreme Court justices. It's of Charles Hamilton Houston. And it's not because he was the first African American admitted. It's because he discovered Thurgood Marshall. When he was dean and Marshall was a first year student, he saw this kid from Baltimore, this brusque, arrogant, brilliant kid who was the smartest lawyer, the best writer, the most profound oralist he had ever encountered. And he tutored him and he mentored him. And at the end of Howard Law School, Thurgood Marshall could have gone and done anything. He graduated in the top of his class. He could have gone to a private law firm in DC. He could have gone to clerkships. And he instead went to the dean. He said, I don't want to do any of those things. I want to go back to Baltimore and I want to fight. So he came back here and he hung up a shingle on Redwood Street, right downtown. Uh, the corner of Charles and Redwood. There's a Kinko's there. You guys know where that Kinko's is? Yeah. So in the back of that Kinko's, there's not even a plaque. I'm going to change that. Uh, he hung up a shingle and opened up his first law firm. And from there, he sued the University of Maryland Law School for not admitting class. Fresh out of law school, 24 years old, he made an argument no lawyer in America had ever made. He made an argument no court in America had ever accepted, and he won. The University of Maryland Law School became the first law school in America to be desegregated by an order of the court, the highest court in Maryland. And the same argument, it was incredible, it was incredible. The same argument Thurgood Marshall made when he was 24 years old in 1932, he made 20 years later when he argued Brown versus Board of Education in front of the United States Supreme Court. That kid's from Baltimore. And he would be proud to see all of us still fighting on his behalf and for the society that he wanted. But he would be ashamed of our schools. He'd be ashamed of how segregated they are. He'd be ashamed of how underfunded they are. He'd be ashamed of how we treat kids in different parts of our city. He'd be ashamed of the violence that racks these neighborhoods that he fought so hard for. Um, but his work is not finished. His story is not finished because we are responsible for carrying it forward. I'm running to be the mayor of Baltimore because I know what this city can be, because I've seen it through the eyes of our children and through the eyes of our forefathers. And I'm so thankful for all of you guys coming out tonight. Thank you guys so much, and I'll now open it up for questions. All right, what do you want to talk about? Yes. You said you love being a public servant. As someone who's oscillating in her job right now, why do you love being a public servant? Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, when I think about the blessings of my own life, I am reminded how easy it would have been to have been stuck in Sri Lanka. You know, my mother's family came over here, my father's family didn't. Um, many of my cousins stayed in Sri Lanka. And when you 
start getting a chance to building the kind of life you want, you have to just choose what your priorities are. Um, I discovered a long time ago that what I need to do, what I want to do, is to try to earn the blessings that just fell upon me. I didn't do anything to get my mom and dad. I didn't do anything to be so lucky to be one of the kids that escaped that island to come here. But I can spend my life earning it. I can spend my life trying to make sure that those same opportunities are available for other kids all across Baltimore. And there is something special about being able to say, this piece of land, this community that we call ours, it's our charge, our responsibility to make better. And over the course of my life, I have been able to say, one year after another, one chapter after another, that we've done some good. Um, this will be, no doubt, the hardest job I've ever had. There's no question about that. Um, I've never wanted another job more. Because if we can accomplish a fraction of a fraction of what I'm talking about, it will be the greatest turnaround story in American history. And to be a part of that, to be a part of that, would be the legacy of a lifetime. Thank you. Yes. Um, you mentioned universal training. If the taxes don't go up, where does the funding come from? Great question. So for those of you guys who can't hear, the question was, you pledge universal pre-K for three and four year olds, where's the money gonna come from, especially if you're also pledging to cut property taxes? So the question is, are you another politician who makes promises but can't actually deliver, or is there actually a plan to how to do this? So for every single idea that we put out that looks like it will cost money, we explain where the money is gonna come from. For universal pre-K, we have pledged to become the first city in America that without federal or state approval would legalize and tax marijuana. So Baltimore City would do to the state of Maryland what Colorado and California did to the federal government. Somebody woke up one morning in Colorado and said, wait, why do we have to wait for DC to do this? What if we just dare them to prosecute licensed marijuana dealers in Denver? And they just did it. They didn't wait, they didn't ask permission, they didn't seek legislation, they just did it. Well, Baltimore can do the same thing. So I woke up one morning and realized that we don't have to wait for Annapolis. Baltimore City and Montgomery County are the only two jurisdictions in the state of Maryland that have independent taxing authority. So we can, on day one, set up a commission, issue licenses, uh, make sure that those licenses are going to businesses that are owned, operated, and controlled by Baltimore City residents, owned, operated, and controlled by minority business owners here in Baltimore that are willing to hire people that have had prior engagements with the criminal justice system and are committed to making sure that the tax revenue that comes from that goes to four things. Universal pre-K, free college for high school graduates from Baltimore City public high schools, to cover the maintenance and repair costs of public schools, that doesn't come out of the budget of principals, and to grow the endowments of HBCUs like Coppin State and Morgan State where my mom used to teach. So that's how we pay for it. Yes. It's kind of a culture of cynicism in Baltimore. I am shouting. I hope you guys can hear me. Is that okay? Yeah. It's kind of a culture of cynicism in Baltimore. Anytime someone suggests a program or to allocate funds to something other than fighting crime, I mean, my, my neighbors, frankly, they just complain. It's not crime. That doesn't bring down the murder rate. I would disagree, especially with things that, you know, threat the pipeline. My question is kind of, how do you plan to combat that cynicism when you, when you introduce all these programs? Yeah, look, um, I have two answers. Um, fighting crime is a marathon and a sprint. It's not one or the other, right? We have to do things immediately to dramatically reduce the rate, and we also have to plant seeds that 50 years from now will germinate. My father had this saying growing up, he said, the best day to have planted a tree was 20 years ago, the next best day is today. So yes, we probably should have had universal pre-K 50 years ago, but we didn't. But we can start that now knowing that the kids that enter pre-K as three and four year olds, in 10 years or old, in 10 years, which is not that far away, are the 13 and 14 year olds that we're worried about with respect to juvenile crime. In 20 years, there's a 23 and 24 year old that we are afraid are committing carjackings and homicides and leading gangs. And so, 
part of it is I have to explain why it's critical to do things in the short term and the long term. Um, but there's a second part of this, which is curing cynicism is partly by delivering results. I think one of the reasons why cynicism has grown is we fail to accomplish any of the things that our leaders claim to accomplish. I sometimes ask this question, what's going wrong in Baltimore? And lots of people shout out lots of things. And then I say, tell me something in Baltimore that's working. And there's silence. The water bill system is broken. Potholes are not getting filled. Crime is through the roof. You can't drink water from the water fountains at the schools. Um, none of it is working. So part of how you cure the cynicism is in very short order, you start showing results. Um, Amy Klobuchar, when she was a local official in Minneapolis, did this thing that I pledged to do here in Baltimore, which is 100 day reports every 100 days. So on day one, we tell you, here are the things we're gonna accomplish in our first 100 days in office. And by the way, mark your calendar in three months, we're gonna have another town hall where we tell you how we did against the metrics that we promised. And we're gonna tell you the next 100 day plan. Sometimes we're gonna tell you that we're gonna fill 75 potholes and we're only gonna fill 50 of them. And the person who's responsible for that is gonna to say to you, we did 50 of them, here's where we struggled, we're recalibrating our goal for the next 100 days. But showing those results is a great way to fight cynicism, and I think that's the way I'd like to do it.